welcome everyone to the Abbey Road Observatory. This is Jim the Filter Guy. We are currently in my backyard in the middle of a large city. You will note that even though we can see some stars, my sky is not dark. There are a lot of porch lights and street lights and just all around glow in the sky. Now, what is a person to do about that if they want to be an amateur astronomer? Well, that is the topic of today's video. How to be an urban astronomer. What sort of tools are available and what sort of expectations one should have. I hope you will enjoy it. But before I get into the video, if you are enjoying these little vignettes that I am preparing, perhaps you'd like to click the like button at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to keep up with everything that the ARO is doing, maybe you'd like to subscribe to the channel. All right, I'll see you all inside. Hello, and welcome to today's video titled how to be an urban astronomer. For the next 20 minutes or so, I will be talking about the challenges associated with trying to be an amateur astronomer in a large city. By the end, I think you will agree that what at first would seem a hopeless pursuit can, in fact, be very rewarding. Let's start with an image that I captured using my cell phone taken in my central Ottawa backyard in early May last year around 11 p.m. The first question that comes to mind is, this is supposed to be a nighttime picture. Shouldn't it be dark out? Unfortunately for those of us that live in or near a large city, night is no longer dark. All the many sources of outdoor lighting that exist in a city have resulted in a dome of light pollution that blots out the night sky. In order to help evaluate just how badly light pollution affects astronomy activities, a sky darkness index has been created. John Bortle first presented his idea of a sky darkness index in the February 2001 issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. The scale that takes his name is based on nine categories, each defined by what can and can't be seen in the night sky under those particular conditions. The Bortle scale is widely used now for evaluating and comparing different nighttime observing locations. Each of the nine steps on the scale has been given a name, from Excellent Dark Sky at Bortle 1 up to an inner city sky at Bortle 9. If you live in Bortle 8 to 9 conditions, there is very little that you can see in the sky with your naked eye. Moving out to the suburbs and Bortle 5 to 7 skies allows for the Milky Way to be observed and a few thousand stars. Going further afield into rural skies will provide you Bortle 3 to 4 skies where you can see structure in the Milky Way and deep sky objects like galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. They all become visible naked eye. Finally, if you are fortunate to find yourself under Bortle 1 to 2 skies, you are in for a treat. Imagine it being so dark that the Milky Way casts a shadow, and there being so many stars visible that you become lost in the night sky. That is every astronomer's dream. This next slide presents you with a simulated view of the night sky later in the summertime. On the Bortle 2 skies, there are thousands of stars visible. The Milky Way is easily visible with lots of structure, and there are numerous deep sky objects visible. Now consider the same scene under Bortle 9 skies. Can you see the difference? 
Only Jupiter, Saturn, and a few bright stars are visible. These images, by the way, were generated using a free piece of software called Stellarium, which is a great tool for exploring the night sky on your computer or mobile device. If you want to know more about the quality of our night skies, there are lots of resources online, including maps of sky darkness, like the one shown here for Eastern Ontario, Canada, which has been generated using satellite data. Very clearly you can see that where there are people, there is light pollution. Most of the city of Ottawa, where I live, is Bortle 8-9. To find skies as dark as Bortle 2, I need to drive at least 90 minutes west into Lanark County. For those of us who are not able to drive to a dark sky, do we just give up on astronomy as a hobby? This would be a very short video if the answer was yes. But of course, the answer is an emphatic no. I've put together a list of objects that an amateur astronomer might be interested in observing, organized from the dimmest on the left to the brightest on the right. Even from Bortle 8, nine, 8 to 9 skies, a large number of these objects are observable using only a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. The sun, moon, and planets are all bright enough to be observed through the light pollution, as well as stars and star clusters. There are some additional objects that are technically observable from an urban location, but the view is not very good. Objects such as some brighter galaxies and nebulae, meteors and comets, are bright enough to see, but their details are lost in the haze. The final group of objects on my list, namely most galaxies and nebulae, are simply too faint to observe visually in the city. You will note, however, that I have put an asterisk beside those last two groups of objects. That is because there are some secret weapons that can help make these otherwise observable, unobservable objects observable. The first secret weapon is light pollution filters. These relatively simple pieces of equipment block man-made light, but allow the light of the object you are trying to observe through. They come in standard sizes that thread conveniently onto the end of your eyepiece or camera. To give you an idea of what you can see at the eyepiece, I have a series of sketches I've made from my central Ottawa backyard of the Orion Nebula using different light pollution filters. You can see that as I move from no filter to progressively more aggressive light pollution filters, the amount of detail that I was able to see was greatly improved. So, light pollution filters are probably looking pretty good right now, but unfortunately they don't entirely solve the problem. There are many brands and types of filter available commercially, but ultimately you will be limited by what filter you can use based on your telescope. Filters, after all, block light, so the size of your telescope plays a role. Also, light pollution filters only work on certain types of nebulae. There isn't a filter available, at least that I have found, that can improve your view of other objects like galaxies or star clusters when you're observing visually. However, all of what I just said is true only if we're talking about visual observing. There is another secret weapon that can remove these limitations, electronically assisted astronomy. Electronically assisted astronomy, or EAA, is essentially using a camera instead of your eyes to collect the light from your telescope. By using a camera, you eliminate many of the limitations of visual observing 
because camera sensors are much more sensitive than our eyes. They are able to see over a much broader range of light wavelengths. They can produce full color images and they can work with software to further process and enhance the raw image. Observing using EAA is quite straightforward. I have a video on my channel that talks a bit more about it. This image is of the setup I use from my urban backyard presently. The camera simply replaces your eyepiece. Most modern EAA cameras connect to your computer via a USB cable. Although options that simply use a video monitor and no PC are available. There are many commercially available choices today at a wide range of prices. To give you a basic idea of what you can do with EAA, consider this simulated image of the Orion Nebula. This is what you might see visually through a telescope with a light pollution filter. The image is monochrome and lacking in detail. Now consider this view, captured from my backyard using a typical color EAA camera and light pollution filter. Much more detail is visible in the EAA image and the colors help to provide more enjoyment and a better understanding of what it is we're looking at. As another example of what can be achieved using EAA, consider these images of springtime galaxies, all of which I captured from my backyard on the same evening. I am especially pleased with this image I captured of the Coma B galaxy cluster. It blows my mind to think that almost every bright dot in this image is a galaxy. Here, let me circle all of them for you to make it more obvious which dots are galaxies. I think it is pretty amazing that we can see this sort of thing from our own urban backyard. In case my last slide was not enough to convince you, here are some more images also captured from my backyard, this time of summertime nebulae. The colors and shapes that are possible in these objects is endless, as well as the range in their size. I find great enjoyment observing these sorts of deep space objects from the comfort of my backyard. I'm sure you are now asking how much all this costs. It is true that the bigger your secret weapon, the more money it costs. Fortunately, the market for filters and cameras has matured a lot in the last five years or so, and there is a broad range of choices available. Filters cost from as little as $50 used up to a crazy $1,000 each. But good filters are available new in the $100 to $200 range. Very capable cameras are available in the $200 to $300 range and go up to a couple of thousand for the fancy ones with giant cooled sensors. Before you do anything, my advice is to join a local astronomy club and start asking questions. You will be surprised at the amount of experience that is available to you, which can save you a lot of time and money. Also, you should start small growing your skills and equipment gradually. It is often the case that newbies dive in and buy thousands of dollars of complicated gear and then very quickly become frustrated trying to figure out how to use it. Urban astronomy, when you are properly informed and outfitted, can be a very rewarding pursuit. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below. Alternatively, you can email me using the address provided in my channel description. If you want to learn more about filters or EAA, check out the other videos I have on my channel on those topics. If you have enjoyed this video, please take a moment to click the like button. To stay up to date on everything going on here at the Abbey Road Observatory, please subscribe to my channel. 
This is Jim, the filter guy, wishing you all clear skies.